We as civil and structural engineers use a lot of tools, a lot of software, and a lot of books as references on a day-to-day -day basis. IS codes and especially IS-456 is one such reference that we may use every day. In this video, I'm going to give you four tips that you can use while interpreting IS codes. Adopting these four points will allow your code interpretation much easier and help you avoid mistakes. Hi all, this is Premjit here from CivilEra.com. As I mentioned, I will give you a few tips that will help you interpret codes in the right way. Interpretation of a code is an art. You will always have to do it in the right way and these tips are going to help you. Right interpretation ensures safe design. It also ensures you don't have to revise your work later. Poor code interpretation wastes your time and efforts. It's sometimes unsafe and at times it's uneconomic. So here are four of my tips for interpreting codes. First thing is that in some cases, your code clauses are more important than tables and notes in that particular clause. So let me demonstrate this with an example. So here you can see a particular table 12, which we refer and this table is a coefficient for your bending moments. So you can see here bending moment coefficients for dead load and imposed load fixed. You have WL square by 12 at the middle of end span and you have WL square by 16 at the interior span and your support moments are WL square by 10 and WL square by 12. So if I put this into a bending moment diagram, it would be something like these are simply supported beams, which are continuous. So let us assume that these are your supports and you have multiple spans and these are continuous beams. So let me use a different color and assume that you have a continuous beam or a slab something like this and it gives you the bending moment diagram by a thumb rule. So it says that your moments are WL square by 12. This is also WL square by 12 and this is WL square by 16 and your support moments are also given here in terms of a coefficient. So that is WL square by 10 at the support next to the end support. So this is going to be WL square by 10. This is also going to be WL square by 10. This is 0 and this is 0. This is what the table means. But then if you miss to read the close, there is something that you are going to miss. So let me show you what is in store in the close. So let me now come to the close. Now, where do I get the close from? So in the table itself, you have the close. 22.5.1 gives you that particular table. So let's see 22.5.1. So here it says that unless more exact estimates are made for beams of uniform cross sections. So now first thing is that your beam has to be of uniform cross section across. It cannot have different depths. Support substantially uniformly distributed loads over three or more spans. Now there are so many conditions which the table is not telling you. So it's very important that you read the close as well. One is that your beam has to be of uniform cross section. It should substantially have uniformly distributed loads and it should have three spans and the span should not differ by more than 15 percentage. So if you are not having these conditions, then the formula mentioned in that table is not really going to be working. It is referring you to table 12 and 13 after you read this particular clause. So it's very important that you read the close and the table together. What I mean to say is the depth of these beams cannot be different. All this has to be uniform. You cannot have 450 depth over here and 600 depth over here. Then this rule may not work. First thing. Second thing is that if this is six meters and if this is two meter, it may not work. The span should not be differing by more than 15 percent that also is mentioned there. Another thing is that if there is a point load somewhere, say a secondary beam is entering here, if there is a point load, it may not work because the code says that it has to be a UDL on top and not a point load and the variation in the UDL also should not be significant. If this has a higher load and if this has a lower load, maybe the formulas here or the table over there may not work. So you have to read the code and the close together. Coming to the second tip. Sometimes your table and notes are more important than the close. Now we saw close being more important, but then sometimes tables and notes are more important. So let's see one example for that. So now if you look at 26.4, the code tells you a nominal cover to reinforcement. And in this particular clause, you are being cross-referred to table 16 for referring the nominal cover. Now let's go to table 16. And you can see here that your exposure, if it is mild, the cover to rebars are 20 millimeters. So for slabs, your cover 
is 20 millimeter even for your beams your cover is 20 millimeter if you have mild exposure but if you read a note over here for main reinforcement up to 12 millimeter diameter bar for mild exposure the nominal cover may be reduced by 5 millimeter so you don't need 20 millimeter cover for your slabs you can have it 15 because generally for slabs we don't use more than 8 or 10 diameter rebars maximum we might use 12 diameter even if you use 12 millimeter up to 12 millimeter you can reduce the cover by 5 millimeters so you need only 15 millimeter for your rebars in slabs now you may think more cover is better yes more cover is better for durability but design point of view your effective depth that is if you have your slab as this and your rebars at the bottom face say you are measuring your effective depth at the tension zone in the middle of the section then this is going to be your effective depth and more effective depth is better for better moment resistance so in this case if you are reducing your cover by 5 millimeter which is allowed by the code which is only mentioned in your notes you can sometimes reduce your steel sometimes you get a steel of say t8 at 90 and then you think that the spacing is too close and you make this into a 10 diameter or you may go for increasing the depth so instead of that if you have that extra 5 millimeter as your effective depth maybe you will get 10 8 at 100 and then you can satisfy your design and you can make use of that particular code condition so here is an example where close doesn't tell you that the table or the note in the table tells you something more so please ensure that you read not just close but the table as well as the notes under that the next tip is that notes and sub notes are also important sometimes you will have notes and also sub notes in the code so i will show you an example right now so if you see this particular table 18 where the load combinations are mentioned you can see that there is a dead load plus wind load combination and then here it says 1.5 times dead load and 1.5 times wind load is a combination that you have to use now you can also see that or 0.9 dl and 1.5 wind load needs to be taken so there are two things here one is that 1.5 is more than 0.9 so why to use that so if you see here there is a sub note you can see here one written here on top of 0.9 and if you see here there are two notes and there is also one sub note which says that this value is to be considered when stability against overturning or stress reversal is critical so now you get a understanding that 1.5 dl plus 1.5 wind load is higher than 0.9 dead load plus 1.5 times wind load but still you have to use 0.9 dl not the highest 1.5 in certain situations and when is that situation it's when you have to consider stability against overturning or stress reversal is critical so if you miss to read the sub note you may not understand why this combination is required so this tip let you know the importance of the sub note or that in some tables you have no notes and you also have sub notes so this reinforces the importance of notes and also sub notes in your is codes now what does this really mean this means that you have to read not just closes but the notes and the sub notes everything are important in some cases closes are more important in some cases tables are important and in some cases notes and sub notes are important so you have to read all of it together and then interpret your code and the next tip that i want to give you is about the discretionary power that an engineer has many times we think that as engineers we have to always stick to code provisions yes that's very much needed that we stick to code provisions but then you also need to know that you have certain discretionary decision powers given by the code so let me show you one such example so here if you look at 27.2 it talks about the expansion joint requirement in your structure so it says that wherever you have a structure which is more than 45 meter in length and you need to have expansion joint in such cases but then it's quickly adding another sentence here which says that however in view of the large number of factors involved in deciding the location spacing and nature of expansion joints the provision of expansion joint in for cement concrete should be left to the discretion of the designer so the designer has a discretion he has the freedom to overrule this but then there should be a logic behind that say for example you can do a temperature load analysis and then ensure that you don't have to provide expansion joint instead of relieving the stresses you can accommodate the stress by doing a temperature load analysis so there are so many discretion that you can use and in many clauses this discretionary power is given to 
uh, designer. You have to know about that so that you can economize the structure or provide more value to your client at times. So let me now show you another example where you need to know how to interpret English language and how it's an art to interpret certain clauses. So here is an example. So if you look at this clause and for a change, this is IS875 part 2, the live load related code. The point 3.3 point 3 clause says that it's a very long sentence. The buildings and structural systems shall provide such structural integrity that the hazards associated with progressive collapse such as that due to local failure caused by severe overloads or abnormal loads not specifically covered therein are reduced to a level consistent with good engineering practice. So this is a very long sentence without a comma without a full stop till the end. So what it means is that as a designer or as a structural engineer, you are responsible for the structural integrity of the building. And it is saying that progressive collapse should be avoided. Things like disproportionate collapse should be avoided as a designer. And it is also saying that a good detailing practice should reduce the possibility of progressive collapse into a local collapse. So what it means is that as a designer, you need to ensure that the building structural scheme is really robust. I cannot explain the entire process over here but then there are different videos and courses that I have on this subject so if you are keen you can get in touch with me. So I hope these four tips are helpful for you to interpret the code in the right way. I suggest you adopt these tips, you ensure you understand the codes and you interpret the codes in the right way for safety and economy. Let me also take this opportunity to let you know that all our mentoring programs and courses are structured in a way that you get a lot of value in every step that we teach you. We look at things holistically and help you improve your technical understanding and use it for the betterment of structural engineering. So in case if you are keen on any of our programs, please see the links that I have dropped in the description. Thank you for watching. Have a great time.